On September 11, 2001, Al-Qaeda terrorists attacked the United States by hijacking four planes and flying them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, with one plane crashing short of its intended target in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Almost 3,000 lives were lost that day, and many survivors continue to suffer to this day. The impact the attack had on both the US and the rest of the world can't be described in words, and on that Tuesday morning, at exactly 8.46 and 40 seconds, all of our lives changed forever. And in this video, we are going to revisit that fateful day, though from a perspective that most of you probably haven't seen before. This is the 9-11 pager leaks, hidden records of a catastrophe. For the overwhelming majority of us, 9-11 is first and foremost one thing, events that happened behind a TV screen. Luckily for most of us, we were not all there in person and only had to experience the horror secondhand, through video broadcasts, photographs and eyewitness accounts. For some people outside Manhattan, the first indication that something had actually happened was the coverage by Fox News subsidiary WNYW, which interrupted a commercial block at exactly 8.48 and 8 seconds. 1 minute and 28 seconds after Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower. Crashed? Jim, just a few moments ago, something uh, believed to be a plane crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. I just saw flames inside, you can see the smoke. They were the first to cover the event in any form, be it radio, television or internet. Only moments later, CNN provided the first live feed with a wide shot of the tower, starting their coverage at 8.49 and 35 seconds. Deaths. Just log on. Number two. Yeah. This just in, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Footage of the actual impact was recorded by French filmmaker Jules Nudet while working on an unrelated documentary film, as well as by Pavel Fla, a Czech immigrant just traveling the city. But these recordings weren't available to the general public until much later, something that is hard to imagine in the age of instantaneous social media posts that only take minutes to go viral. But for a Goldman Sachs computer technician, news came even faster than that, through their pager. Younger viewers may rightfully ask at this point, what's a pager? Well, it's a portable communications device, used to mostly receive and very rarely send short text messages comparable to SMS, way before cell phones were as widespread. While they are not as common anymore, people working in emergency services may still use them, because compared to regular cell phone SMS, there is one major difference that makes it more resilient to network congestion in times of disaster. And that is, no encryption and no real authentication or even acknowledgement that the message had been received. Every pager basically receives every message in the tower's area, but only displays the message directed to its own number, in what could be described as a gentleman's agreement between manufacturers. It is entirely practical nowadays to just buy a cheap software-defined radio module and program it to receive as well as lock every pager message in your area. And it appears like someone, possibly a pager service provider, ran a similar operation on September 11 in the New York area, giving us the unique opportunity to glance into a different layer of personal and professional communication. Let's check out a random message from the early morning hours to see what it looks like, because Wikileaks was nice enough to include the complete record with all metadata included. It starts with the date and time, followed by the service provider name and the recipient's pager number. Next is the alarm mode, followed by the indicator whether the message is alphanumeric, numeric or just a tone. Everything after that is the text body of the message. The part that actually appears on the recipient's device, which uh, in this case indicates that someone named Sean was planning on not being at the North Tower until 45 minutes after the first attack. Let's hope he kept his word. Now that was at 7.51. Let's jump ahead to 8.46 and 30 seconds and sync up pager messages to the impact of Flight 11. Stop. It is now 8.46 and 46 seconds and what we're seeing here in our pages stream is actually the first message, the very first written record, that indicated something terrible had just happened. Let's take a closer look. Once again, our metadata tells us date and time, the recipient's number, mode and type of the message, but the text body, which is clearly automated in this case, contains service information for an IT technician working at Goldman Sachs. Page from Lifeline tells the recipient the origin of the message. 
alert followed by a number is the reference number of this particular service interruption. ETS is short for Electronic Trading System and the URL following that is the address of a former Goldman Sachs server. The abbreviations after that are not well documented but very likely stand for Electronic Trading System, Real-Time Correlation Engine, the software that produced the error. Following that is the actual error message, Market Data Inconsistent, Cantor API Problem, Trading System Offline. Finishing the message is once again the server's URL, username and a process ID. To understand this message, we first need to take a look at who was in the World Trade Center at the time of the impact. Flight 11 crashed into floors 93 to 99, destroying almost everything there and cutting off everyone above. Two to six floors higher were the offices of Cantor Fitzgerald, a financial services company that ran among other things the Cantor Exchange, a digital US treasury futures marketplace at which Goldman Sachs and many other companies were trading. Cantor Fitzgerald became well known after the attacks as they lost 658 of the 960 New York employees, every single person that reported for work that day. After the plane destroyed much of the floors below, the company's internet connection was interrupted and the Goldman Sachs server realized immediately that due to a lack of updates for just a few seconds, Cantor market data was falling out of sync with the real-time correlation engine. Two seconds later, this message was followed by the more definitive error, the connection from Goldman to Cantor was down. Since in these high-frequency trading markets, fractions of a second are often worth thousands of dollars, the Goldman system was configured to alert the technician immediately and this is exactly what it did in this haunting first account of the September 11 attacks. But let's continue, because another noteworthy message was recorded at 8.47 and 46 seconds, 1 minute and 6 seconds after the impact, and that was the first written indication by an actual human being of the attacks. Someone just told me there was an explosion at WTC. It is noteworthy that at this point information was still word of mouth. WNYW and CNN had not broken the news yet and rumors started to be spread via personal phone calls and pager messages. Now let's fast forward a few minutes to 9.02 and 57 seconds. At that moment, Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower, an event that was broadcast live on most US TV networks and one that shook the world due to its media presence. Any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my god. Oh my god. That looks like a second plane. 42 seconds later, we see an eerily familiar pager message pop up. It reads, DSG server TWS admin, Euro broker line down. It's once again an error message received by a Credit Suisse first Boston employee, informing them that the connection to Euro broker, which probably refers to the company Euro brokers, had been interrupted. Their offices were on the 84th floor of the South Tower, right at the impact zone. Employee Brian Clark reached notoriety for being one of only 18 people to escape from the impact zone or above in the South Tower, and his account of the events is really worth a read. For many of his colleagues, however, help never came, and this message serves as a permanent record of that moment. The following minutes and hours were marked by a lot of chaos, and channels started to be filled by emergency response teams and people trying to reach their relatives. At 9.09, .09, Tiffany, trying to reach her significant other, wrote, Hey sweetheart, I just heard. Could you give me a call in the lab and let me know that you're okay? 20 minutes later, she sent another message, asking for them to call. This goes on all through the day until she wrote the last message at 5 p.m. which said, Hey sweetheart, I still can't get through to you. The phone lines are still overloaded. I will be in the lab until 6.30. My bus leaves at 6.47 and I should be home by 7.20 or so. If you can, could you call? Unfortunately, we will never know whether that person did eventually call, but I really do hope so. In a similar string of messages, Sherry tried to find out whether or not her husband was alive, but her messages sound a little more unhinged. At 9.36, are you watching the news about the World Trade Center? This was from me, Sherry, call me. Please call me, I need to know you're alive. I am panicking and I will assume you're dead unless I hear. At 10.55 she goes on to write, I am now calculating how much money I am going to collect from your life insurance because if you don't call me now to tell me you are not dead, I am going to kill you. Please call me, I am panicking. I am starting to make your funeral arrangements. And her final message after that, if I don't hear from you by high noon, I am going to pick up Laura at school and tell her her father is dead. However, for this number at least, there were a few messages towards the end of the day that could indicate that this person did survive. Nevertheless, this is extremely painful to read. And the worst part is the unfiltered nature of this record. These are not carefully crafted narratives after the fact, but live snippets from real people's lives at the moment they were in deep distress. 
Some of the messages I've just shown you were difficult to digest and due to the sheer size of the archive I can only show so much, but I really didn't want to end this video on such a low note, which is why I'm going to conclude it with two particular messages that, if nothing else, at least show some humanity in all this chaos and despair. At 9.30 and 45 seconds between the second impact and the first tower's collapse, Iris wrote, the World Trade Center was hit by two planes, turn on the TV if you can. P.S. The furniture arrived and looks great. Well, good for you Aris, I wish whoever you sent this message to also liked it. And for the final message of this video, at 11.16 after both towers had collapsed and the sheer magnitude of the event started to become apparent, Mike wrote, can I put on my weekly report that we didn't sell anything today due to terrorist activity? Yes Mike, uh, yes you can and I sincerely hope your boss agreed.